become clear to me that uh, this prolonged leadership turmoil uh, would do uh, irreparable harm to the institution. Uh, so this morning, I informed my colleagues that uh, resigned from the speakership and resigned from Congress at the end of October. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us now is James Sorrento, columnist for the Wall Street Journal, editor of OpinionJournal.com. Hello, James. Hi, how are you? Good to talk to you again, sir. All right, so this caught uh, many people by surprise, at least that it happened today after the emotional meeting with the Pope yesterday and the, uh, the emotional uh, speech by the Pope or the emotional response to the speech by the Pope by John Boehner in, in, in the House. Uh, so uh, what's your reaction? Well, uh, there was certainly, uh, although the re resignation caught people by surprise, there was the expectation of a leadership fight. Uh, there were varying opinions as to whether he could have won that leadership fight. Uh, the logic of this move uh, seems uh, uh, unassailable. Uh, there was going to be this fight. It was going to cause a lot of, uh, a lot of bad blood, and uh, why not just take himself out of it? On the other hand, if anybody expects that uh, the conservative complaint that Congress wasn't getting anything done or wasn't standing up effectively to the president is going to be addressed by Boehner's absence, I think they're going to be disappointed because Boehner was really, uh, to my mind, uh, a scapegoat for that complaint. Uh, the reason that Congress hasn't been able to stand up effectively to President Obama is because he is a uh, smart and willful adversary who picks his battles uh, carefully uh, and picks battles that he can win, and that he can win not because uh, Boehner and uh, McConnell are weak, but because, of, uh, but because he has structural advantages by virtue of being president. Well, yeah, absolutely, he has, he has those advantages. You know, it's funny, today the president uh, said that um, um, uh, Boehner realized that you, you have to compromise and you can't get everything you want, yet this president is the first president that anybody could remember that when it came to these budget fights and the debt ceiling, et cetera, that he absolutely was, was wanted the government to shut down, uh, wanted to do it for political purposes, and said, I will not compromise. So, um, you know, Boehner was up again. I, I'm no fan of Boehner. But, but you know, when, when the government shut down um, a, couple of, a, couple of, a couple of years ago, I guess, was, or maybe, yeah, a couple of years ago, yeah. a, a year later, Republicans won a tremendous landslide. Yeah, well, I mean, all right, so you can say that the damage to Republicans politically from the shutdown was, uh, was not as great as some people worried that it might have been. I think it's a stretch to say that, therefore, the shutdown didn't do any didn't do them any damage, or shutdowns in general don't do Republicans any damage. Uh, you know, in a way, Obama is right to say he has to compromise, I don't, in the sense that if you are the President of the United States, you can make a unilateral decision to stand firm. If you're the Speaker of the House or the Majority Leader of the Senate, you have to hold together a caucus consisting of members who have, uh, to some extent, divergent ideologies and often uh, disparate uh, uh, political interests. So, in fact, the president is an advantage, uh, at an advantage for that reason. This president has also picked areas where, uh, you know, he structured the fights so that the Republicans can't beat him. For instance, the Iran deal was structured as an executive agreement. It didn't require any change of law, and that meant that there was no way for Congress to block it short of a uh, two-thirds majority. Well, they, 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 uh, most scholars, Willow, would say that, uh, you know, and, and legal experts would say that they could have, you know, insisted that it was a treaty and voted to block it. I mean, and then it could have gone maybe to the courts or something. I mean, you know, in their traditional role as needing two-thirds to have it passed, they, they gave in on, on that. And McConnell, man, McConnell has done nothing in the Senate. I, I mean, the only bill he sent them is uh, Obama's keystone. But what do you mean, insist that it was a treaty? I mean, I mean, uh, treat it as what, a treaty and, and vote it that way without ever, uh, without ever voting uh, to change the, the, the whole the scenario into uh, where Obama threw his arms up and said, OK, you beat me. And of course, he won, because, as you said, you need two thirds to defeat it instead of two thirds to approve it. Yes, but in fact, it is not a treaty because it entails no change in laws. Everything that Obama did under this deal was done under existing statutes, namely the statutes imposing sanctions, which allow the president to uh, uh, enact a waiver, and uh, the uh, UN Charter, which is a treaty that was, uh, that was uh, ratified by the Senate in 1945. Uh, nobody disputes that the president has the authority to decide how the U.S. votes at the Security Council, which was what really made this... Uh, 
this agreement on uh, irresolvable. Right, you know as, what, then, as, James? Then, then, then McConnell should invoke the nuclear option and need 51 votes to kill this. Uh, okay, so you invoke the nuclear option. All right, then you pass the resolution of disapproval, which goes to the president. He vetoes it. They don't have enough uh, votes to override the veto. It's a symbolic victory. It's, uh, it, you know, it would have been nice if, uh, if, they had forced a, uh, if they had forced the president to issue a veto, but it still would, have, would not have changed the final outcome. And it would have had the effect. Uh, but the no, no, time. if they don't have, but if they, if they have a majority against it, it doesn't pass. No, 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 it's not. What had to pass was a resolution of disapproval. Uh, the president had the right, right, right. for existing law to do everything he did. So, okay, you pass the resolution of disapproval with, uh, what did they have, 58 votes. Right, he that vetoes goes it. The, yeah. That goes to the president. I, he vetoes it. Well, uh, they don't have the votes well, to, uh, you know, to override the veto. I understand, but some would say that symbolic is better than nothing. Listen, gr James, great to talk to you. Thank you. Tim Graham is next, folks. Don't go away. As the Pope's historic visit to the United States continues to dominate the headlines, more and more Americans are asking, who is Pope Francis? As always, Newsmax has got you covered. Learn more about Pope Francis and his humble rise to the Vatican in the book, Francis, A Pope for Our Time. Get this special offer right now at Newsmax.com Pope or by calling 800-203-7047. Learn about the personal experiences that shape Pope Francis' pastoral commitment to society's most underprivileged and disenfranchised with this hardcover biography from Newsmax. Order right now at Newsmax.com Pope or call 800-203-7047.